Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to the program that fills your hearts, souls, and minds with the words of God. This is the third season of Feed Thy Soul. Before we start today's episode, let us have the opening prayer. Think the name of the child Jesus and of the Holy Spirit. How wonderful was the short night union. Your life became a mirror of angelic purity, of love is strong as death, and of wholehearted abandonment to God. We implore your miraculous intercession. Give us your childlike faith to see the faith of God in the people and experiences of our life, and to love God with full confidence. Our Carmelite sisters, now that you rejoice in your reward for your virtues, cast a glance of pity on us as we leave at your hands what we yearn for so ardently at this moment of our formation. With the grace of God, we may continue to live our preaching to you as you led us. Amen. Last episode, we had our sixth lesson for the temporary promise tree entitled Encounter with God Through the Word and Mary. For today's episode, we are going to discuss lesson seven entitled Love Overflows. That's right, my twin sister. Today, we are going to talk about the rest love of neighbor. When we come back, we will now start our discussion about the overflowing love of Therese. And now we're back to feed thy soul. Like what was stated earlier, we are now going to talk about the rest and love of neighbor. Therese recalled the fundamental grace of her life, the grace of her complete conversion on Christmas Eve 1886. She affirmed, from that moment on, she felt charity enter her heart and the need to forget herself and to please others. When Therese entered Carmel on April 9, 1888, she had already acquired great self-mastery and without batting an eye, she put with the difficulties of community life, notably the pinquits inflicted on her by Sister St. Vincent de Paul. Very skillful with her hands, this lay sister is called Therese for being so slow in performing her manual task and gave her the nickname Big Kid Good. This was her way of letting Therese know that she should be working faster. Therese perceived the gentle hand of Jesus, giving her the opportunity to perform sacrifices for the salvation of sinners. With a generous heart, she offered her sacrifices to him. She also offered during the time of her novitiate to accompany the invalid sister St. Pierre to the refectory each evening. Therese's great strength of soul was rooted in the inner conviction that Jesus was there, very near her, that he was asking the sacrifice of her, and that on the last day, he would reward her a hundredfold for all the efforts she made in this life to obey his commandment of love. When Mother Agnes asked her in February 1883 to help Mother Marie de Gonzaga with the formation of the novices, the rest was content with teaching them the little ways she had already discovered for surmounting the thousand and one difficulties of community life. My twin 
sister, can you discuss to us the rest practical counsels? Of course, my own sister. A thoroughly evangelical charity, Therese Cavison was not to compose a systematic treatise on prayer or love of neighbor. The teaching she dispensed to her novices was a series of very practical counsels supported by gospel principles. My neighbor's talents. Like a good psychologist, Therese had observed two forms of jealousy. First, what we do not possess and the lack of which saddens us. Second, the fervor of the charity animating the heart of a brother or sister highlights by contrast our own mediocrity. What are the principles? The rest suggest to overcome this form of envy or jealousy. The essential worth of persons does not come from the quantity of talents that God has entrusted to them, but from the way these individuals make them bear fruit and from the quality of their love. God alone knows the true worth of his soul. Our worth is not measured by the number of talents received or acquired, nor by the brilliance of our intellect, nor even by the splendor of our apostolic works, but solely by the quality of our love. Perfection consists in doing His will, in being what He wills us to be. So that is number one point, not number two. No, number two. It is for the benefit of the entire body that the Lord grants charisms to these or that member. When we are tempted to be envious or jealous of others because of the brilliance of their talents, we should immediately recall the relative worth of these gifts and that they have been bestowed for the good of all. My neighbor's gifts are mine. The second manner of feeling jealous of others is often present among souls striving for sanctity. So you see, those who are striving for sanctity are also um, affected by jealousy. Spiritual jealousy, they say. When we come back, we will continue our discussion about Lesson 7. Want to be a writer? Got the desire to be heard over the radio? How about work on TV? CN Sky College can get you there. CN Sky College offers mass communication instructions major in broadcasting and communication arts, complete with a dynamic team, competitive instructors, and conducive training facilities to anchor your skills and performance in media practices. The vast world of media awaits you. And let CN Sky College take you there. CN Sky College, more than a decade of academic excellence in the Ilocandia. And now we're back to feed thy soul. Let us continue our discussion. The question now is, what means does the rest propose to us for covering the second form of jealousy? Number one, let us be content to be daisies or violets in Jesus' garden, if that is our vocation, and not envy the lot of the lilies and the roses. It takes all kinds to make a world. This is just as true in the spiritual world as it is in the material one. I understood, writes Therese, that if all flowers wanted to be roses, nature would lose her springtime beauty and the fields would no longer be decked out with little wild flowers. And so it is in the world of souls Jesus garden. He willed to create great souls, but he has also created 
is known at once. Thoreau had understood that such an assurance transforms the way you look at others. Instead of wasting time being jealous of the good they do, instead of looking for weak points, we take pleasure in admiring all the good that is accomplished in the world and consider it as a family possession and offer it to God. When the rest was inquired, she used to offer to God the prayers of her sisters. She writes that the fervor of my sisters makes up for my lack of fervor. When the rest received communion, she offered Jesus the love and the merits of the Blessed Virgin, the angels, and the saints. The rest said, this is because she knew that she could present herself before God clothed in the infinite merits of Jesus Christ as to him and in him in the spiritual riches of the Virgin, the angels and the saints. The rest also believes that love is patient. Love is patient. It endures all things. For dealing with impatience, the rest has two distinct approaches. First, in the heat of anger, is stirred by someone's unkind remark. The rest exhorted her novices to refrain from any angry word or gesture when they felt their tempers flaring up. She said there are only two things to carry out, an act of faith and an act of love. The rest believes that we should consider the person irritating us as a real or disagreeable character of a sister. She thought instead of Jesus present in this trial. The rest was a master in the art of a smiling life while she was being sorely tempted to impatience and her smile was indeed the outward expression of her vibrant faith in the apostolic effectiveness of her renunciation of self-love. When Monsieur Martins have seemed to have somewhat improved, it was thought at first that he might be able to attend his daughter's wedding on September 24, 1890. But at the last moment, the rest uncle Monsieur Isidore Galim prudently decided that the moving ceremony would be too much for his brother-in-law. Therese was deeply disappointed by her uncle's decision and could not hold back her tears. But in the midst of her weeping, her faith reflects intervened and wrote Salim on the eve of her wedding. How can I tell you what is taking place in my soul? It is torn apart, but I feel that this wound is made by a friendly hand, by a divinely jealous hand. It is Jesus alone who is conducting this affair. It is He and I recognize His touch of love. The rest ends the letter. Ah, if I were able to convey to you the peace Jesus placed in my soul at the height of my tears, this is what I am asking Him for you who are myself. This significant example shows that profound peace of soul can coexist with wounded sensitivity. When we come back, we will continue our discussion about Lesson 7. With zeal have I been zealed for the Lord God of hosts. 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 10 and 14. The Disco of Carmelites celebrates the fifth birth centenary of St. Teresa of Avila on March 28, 2015. Join the Carmel of a Holy Family launched the celebration on October 15, 
2012. A possession at the Pindangan Road, it starts at 6.15 a.m. before the Holy Mass. St. Teresa of Avila Community, La Union, invites lay people to join the secular order of Discalls Carmelites. A degree of maturity, understanding, and well-being is necessary for the members' adequate formation and for full participation in the life of the secular order. Aspirants should be at least 21 years old and not more than 60 years old. However, the Council may make exceptions to this provision if it discerns a candidate to be physically and mentally capable of undergoing formation. The community meets every third Saturday at 8 a.m. at the OCBS House of Prayer. The Spirit of Carmel is for everyone. And now we're back to Feed Thy Soul. Let us continue our discussion. To exhort her novices to patience, Therese said, Consider those who wound you as God's instruments. Let yourself be humiliated. It is God himself who is humbling you. Therese advised when someone exasperates you. When you are exasperated with someone, the way to recover your peace is to pray for that person and to ask God to reward her for giving you the opportunity to suffer. However, this patience must not degenerate into passive resignation in the face of human maliciousness. To remain Christian, patience must be accompanied by a courageous and aggressive attitude before human malice and injustice. Christ did not just have himself put on the cross by his enemies. He fought against the sin of the Pharisees. He denounced it. The rest knew this and never hesitated to correct the faults of the novices in her charge. You see, I must die with my weapons in hand, she said in this regard during the last months of her life. Second, after we cool off, applicable later, once the emotions come down. The rest shows us that our impatience with others is frequently due to ignorance on our part. A better understanding of our neighbor keeps us from many useless outbursts of anger. The rest invites us not to forget all the graces that we have already received and to ask ourselves, what would others have become if they had received one half of the graces of life and the strength that we ourselves have received? Much better, perhaps. Let us excuse Sister Marie of St. Joseph, whom she had in the linen room for her nasty temper. She treated her with all her heart. It is not her fault. If she is godly and bold, she said. The rest also made it a point to look for others' good qualities when the devil tries to place before her eyes the faults of others. I sense her virtues, her good intentions, she said. The deepest motivation for the rest patience was her communion with the very patience of God, with that forbearance of the Lord, who never grows weary of waiting for the conversion of sinners and does not become annoyed with their slow progress. My dear sister, can you discuss to us patience with oneself? That's my thing to Of course, my twin sister and I, an important of 
observation must be made in conclusion. We would be seriously mistaken to imagine that the rest overcame all her temptations of impatience by the systematic application of this cool approach. To the end of her life, there were still times when she was so sorely tempted to be disagreeable with Sister Teresa of St. Augustine that she felt it more prudent just to leave the room in which they were working together. Teresa, the child Jesus, daughter of the little way, does not forget that it is difficult always to be faithful to this line of conduct. But we must never get discouraged. In order to be patient with others, we must first have patience with ourselves. Teresa often insisted on this point. We should not lose heart at the sight of our weakness, but rather glory in our infirmities. This indicates how much the rest love of neighbor was a reflection of the love she bore for herself. If she was so indulgent with others, it was because, first of all, she was very indulgent and patient with herself. Charity that grows deeper. The rest discovered the manner in which the Lord commands us to love others as Jesus has loved us. It is no longer enough to love others as we love ourselves according to the law of the Leviticus, but we must love them as Jesus himself loves them as much as he loves them. So let's ask herself, how did Jesus love his disciples and why did he love them? It was not their natural qualities that would have attracted him, since there was between him and them an infinite distance. He was knowledge, eternal wisdom, when they were poor, ignorant fishermen, filled with earthly thoughts. And still, Jesus called them his friends, his brothers. The rest understood. For a long time, that God loves us despite our wretchedness. Charity consists in bearing with the faults of others, in not being surprised at their weakness, in being edified by the smallest acts of virtue we see their practice. Charity must not remain hidden in the bottom of the heart. Jesus has said, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel basket, but upon the lobster, so as to give light to all in the house. My good sister Nile, can you discuss to us the story of the lamb? Yes, my good sister. For the rest, it seems that this lamb represents charity which must enlighten and rejoice not only those who are dearest to us, but all who are in the house without distinction. Therese understood that she must light a lamp, enlighten and make happy all who are in the house. In other words, the sisters who are the least amiable, she must not only sit beside during recreation, but she must seek to make them happy in as many ways possible. She offers her sisters a spiritual banquet of a loving and joyful charity. Since the sweet flame of charity expanded her heart, the rest felt that the love she evoked in her sister's hearts in this way was only reinforcing their love for God. That is what she explained to the same sister Marie of the Trinity, who was wondering whether she loved her mistress too much. On the back of a holy card that she wrote her on May 7, 1896, Therese had copied this thought from St. John of the Cross. The affection for a creature is purely spiritual if the love of God 
goes where it goes, or if the love of God is remembered as often as the affection is remembered, or if the affection gives the soul a desire for God, if by going in one, the soul goes also in the other. Expression of our love for God, of the joyful acceptance of His will, this cheerfulness also manifested by desire to console those around her, saddened by the prospect of her approaching death. Participation in the love of Christ, the rest finally understands and most profoundly that it is impossible for her to realize this magnificent program if Jesus does not come into her to love all those whom he has her to love. From this comes the exclamation that she places at the heart of Rahab. Ah, how I love this new commandment, since it gives me the assurance that your will is to love in me all those you command me to love. We would certainly believe that on April 10, 1896, the rest already understood Jesus' will to love in her all her sisters. On that day, she writes to Leonie, Dear little sister, I cannot tell you all the deep thoughts my heart contains concerning yourself. The only thing I want to say is this, I love you a thousand times more tenderly than ordinary sisters love each other, for I can love you with the heart of our celestial spouse. On July 9, 1895, understanding more than ever how much Jesus desires to be loved, she had offered herself as a victim to merciful love. The following Friday, while making the way of the cross, she suddenly felt herself wounded by such an ardent flame of love that she understood that God was fully ratifying her obligation and was letting the floods of His love break upon her. She then understood perfectly that she could love God with the very heart of God. But it was only the last months of her life that she received the grace of understanding that she could likewise love her neighbor at every moment with the same heart of God present in her heart. Let us also discuss the luminous beacon of love. Therese wrote, I understand that the church had a heart and that this heart was burning with love. I understood that it was love alone that made the church members act that if love ever became extinct, apostles would not preach the gospel and martyrs would not shed their blood. I understood that love comprised all vocations, that love was everything, that it embraced all times and places, in a word that it was eternal. Then, in excess of my delirious joy, I cried out, O oh Jesus, my love, my vocation at last I have found it. My vocation is love. Yes, I have found my place in the church. And it is you, O oh my God, who have given me this place. In the heart of the church, my mother, I shall be loved. Thus I shall be everything, and thus my dream will be realized. O oh, luminous beacon of love, I know how to reach you. I have found the secret of possessing your flame. I am only a child, powerless and weak, and yet it is my weakness that gives me the boldness of offering myself as a victim of your love. Oh Jesus, but why do I desire to communicate your secrets of love, O oh Jesus? For was it not you alone who taught them to me? And can you not reveal them to others? Yes, I know it, and I beg you to do it. 
I beg you to cast your divine glance upon a great number of little souls. I beg you to choose a legion of little victims worthy of your love. That's all for our today's lesson. We hope you enjoyed our discussion about the rest overflowing love. Let us end this episode with a prayer. Loving God, as we close today's session of our temporary promise free class, we seek your help. May the world and work of St. Therese, considered a saint and doctor of the church, guide us in discovering the beauty and gifts we possess. May we always be open to the direction of the Spirit and never forget the love you have for each other. Give us the courage to show others the talents they have. Help us serve others in the community and in so doing, build up your kingdom. Almighty Father, we pray that you will watch over us as we depart from this temporary promise free class. We beseech your guidance and protection in all of our endeavors. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us in feeding your hearts, souls and minds with the words of God. This is the third season of Feed Thy Soul. See you again next episode. Bye!